normalization of the data. Okay. Lost my page turner. Oh. <laughs> So this is a picture of the board. Um, it's what we call our Raptor Logic board. It's just one that we build in our Twinsburg facility, Twinsburg, Ohio. Um, it's got a nice mixture of components. It's got a lot of BGAs. Uh, the smallest BGA is a 0.5 millimeter pitch. There's a 0.4 millimeter pitch QFP, and it's got four different pen and paste connectors per module, so a total of eight per panel. So a nice mix. I mean, you've got some really big components. You've got some really small components. Uh, it's exactly the type of thing that we're, you know, we're fighting with. So those are the, the different parts that we looked at, some resistor nets, resistor packs, 5-pin SOT, BGAs, and a small SOIC-8. Okay. So getting into some of the results. Um, we looked at the surface of the different apertures, and you can see here the three different materials that we looked at. The PhD materials there on the far left, fine grain in the middle, the nickel on the right. Maybe a little bit hard to see in this presentation, but um, it's apparent that the PhD has a much rougher wall surface than the fine grain, and the fine grain is you know, rougher still than the nickel. So the nickel did indeed have the, you know, the nicest, smoothest uh, surface area, surface wall. Uh, so that kind of, you know, that's what we expected. Um, and you know, we would expect, therefore, for the nickel material to release better. So, next. So data, we looked at the actual output of the solder paste inspection and what this is is a box plot of the data. It kind of gives you an idea of where the mean transfer efficiency is, but also, you know, look at the spread of the data. So the taller those boxes are, the more spread you have in the data, the more noisy that data is, I guess you could say. So what we saw was a little bit unexpected. Uh, the PhD material um, actually released better than the nickel or the fine grain from the mean standpoint. And what was even more unexpected was the nickel material, which is supposed to be sort of the cure-all, supposed to be the best case. Um, not only did it have a little bit smaller mean than the PhD, but the spread in the data was a lot wider. So that means there's a lot more variability in that, you know, that print. So it's not exactly what we expected. Didn't really support our hypothesis. Next. Excuse me? What was the median? The median? Yeah. So you had a yeah, so we're look well if you back up. So you can see the mean is uh, the line that's connecting the box plots. The actual line here that's in the middle of the box is the median. So you asking what the value is for it? Okay. All right, next. So digging a little bit further into the data, um, what we found was, you know, we did some statistical comparison of the three sets of data, and um, what we found was that apparent difference was not really statistically significant. Um, you can see here we did an ANOVA for the means, and you see there's a p-value there of uh, 0.126. And what that means is a p-value is basically a, um, it's a probability that those uh, those distributions are, are equivalent, they're the same, that they're from the same population. Uh, the higher that number is, the less, you know, the more likely that they're the same. The lower it is, the more likely that they're actually from different populations. So typically in statistical, statistical analysis, if that number is below 0.05 or 5%, um, we can pretty confidently say that those are different populations. Anything above 5% or 0.05, we really don't have enough statistical basis to say that those are different. So, you know, in this case, um, you know, what looked different on that chart, statistically, you know, we, we can't really say that there's any difference between the two. Uh, the same thing for the variance. You know, you saw the, the bigger box size for the, the uh, nickel material. It was kind of surprising to us, but once we did the statistical analysis, again, we get a p-value that's over 0.1. It's well over our threshold, so you know, we can't say statistically that you know, that bigger looking box, that, that bigger variation for the nickel material was significant. So there's nothing in this data that tells us that any of those materials are any better than the others. So you know, it was a little bit unexpected. We really expected the nickel material to perform better than the others, and we just didn't see that. Okay, next. We did see one, you know, what I'll call an anomaly here. Um, 
we did a bunch of main effects plots and basically this just takes the average of all the data and kind of plots it um, with one point and you can kind of get an idea of trending if you do that. Um, and what we saw as we started looking at the main effects for the different area ratios, um, we've got area ratio here starting over one and decreasing as you go to the right. Um, you can see relatively the, the nickel material and the PhD which are the two points at the right of the graph, they sort of, sort of stay the same throughout all those different area ratios. Um, you know, their relative position on the chart is the same. But look at what happens with the fine grain material. On the larger apertures, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's much less, much lower than the other uh, materials. But as you go smaller, it actually gets better. It actually releases better. So um, it wasn't consistent across all pad sizes. It's not something that we can say with, you know, a great deal of certainty that the fine grain is going to perform better on these very small apertures. But it was an interesting trend that we saw. Um, more studies, you know, going to be needed here to verify that. But um, it is something that will probably kick off a little bit further investigation on our parts. Uh, but at this point, we're not really ready to act on that yet. Okay. So that's the materials. Now we'll kind of get into the aperture cutting methods. And again, we looked at the pulse jag laser. You can see some pictures of that over on the far left. And this is what I was talking about with that scalloping um, um, features. You can kind of see uh, those different lines in the cut edge of the stencil that kind of demark the, the pulsing of the laser as it goes through the material. And if you look at the same thing over here on the fiber optic laser, those spaces are much closer together. So that's sort of indicative of the, the smaller spot size on the fiber optic laser as, as well as the higher frequency pulsing as it goes through. It moves those, uh, those scallops a little bit closer together. They have a little less height, gives you a smoother wall surface. Uh, you can see here, uh, relatively rough wall, uh, gets smoother here. And then the EFAB nickel, which is not a cutting process, it gives you a very smooth wall surface. So same sort of analysis that we did here, uh, did some box plots to look at the kind of the mean and the spread of the data. Um, in this graph here, I don't know if you can read it very well, but the EFAB is on the far left, uh, followed by fiber optic laser, then a fiber optic laser with electropolish, and the pulse laser is the one on the far right. And this is pretty much exactly what we would expect based on our hypothesis. Uh, the EFAB had the smoothest wall, gave us the best release. We like that. Uh, the fiber optic laser was the next smoothest wall surface, and it's you know a little bit less than the the EFAB, and the pulse jag or the pulse jag laser, which was the roughest wall, gave us the um, uh, the least amount of pace released. A little surprising with the electro polish um, that's supposed to smooth out the walls a little bit, give you a smoother surface. You would expect that to perform a little bit better than the fiber optic laser. It didn't. Um, you know, we think we know why that is. There's some studies out there that kind of look into that, and um, you know, we feel that the, the electro polish may actually do more harm than it does good. It sort of smooths it out, yeah, but it does some other things that are um, a little bit undesirable. So, um, not used as much. You know, it's an extra process that you have to pay for anyway. So, um, that's not such a bad thing. But this pretty well supported our hypothesis. That smooth wall does seem to correlate to a much better pace release. Next. So we went a little bit further with the data analysis. Um, we took these stencils you know, apart and we put them in a machine to actually measure the stencil apertures. Because one of the things we wanted to make sure is that we were you know, comparing apples to apples. We had different stencils from different manufacturers. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we take as much variability out of the analysis as we can and make sure that what we're looking at is actual you know, process variability. So, you know, just, just a word about a stencil, you know, the typical cutting of a stencil. It's not a nice rectangular cut in the stencil um, material. You actually get a little bit of a taper in the stencil wall. And that has to do with the, you know, the method of cutting. There's a little bit of spread in that laser beam as it goes around the um, cutting the aperture. But it also serves a functional purpose. I mean, with the uh, walls kind of tipped in a little bit, larger at the bottom than at the top, it kind of aids in paste release. 
you can imagine it's going to pull off of that a little bit better than if it was just um, a vertical wall. So what we did was we took measurements of the stencils both on the bottom side and on the top to get an idea of how much taper we have and calculate the actual volume that's inside that aperture and then use that to normalize our data that we got from this uh, paste inspection system. And what we found was that um, there was a pretty big variation in the amount of taper we got based on the, the method of cutting. Um, EFAB stencils had the least amount of taper, which would kind of be expected because it's not a cutting process. It is, you know, as has been discussed, it's actually a growing process. You, you know, grow the nickel up over, you know, on a mandrel around the actual apertures. So you get a nice flat wall there. You get about a half a mil of taper with that. Fiber optic lasers were very good, you know, pretty comparable to the EFAB. Um, fiber optic laser with e-polish here, you know, you see that, you know, one of the things that's happened with that e-polish is it's actually kind of eroding that, uh, that stencil wall a little bit and increasing the taper. And then the YAG lasers, the older um, versions of these lasers uh, had uh, a great deal, you know, over a mil of taper over, you know, in a six mil stencil. So that's pretty significant. So what we did was we used this data to sort of normalize and, you know, adjust the ideal stencil volume that's used to calculate transfer efficiency and then took another look at all of our data. So next. So you remember that chart that I showed a couple of slides back where we were looking at the different cutting methods where we had the nice, you know, expected results for the different types of cutting methods. Well, once we normalize for the actual aperture size, uh, suddenly it looks a little bit different. Um, EFAB looks about the same. You know, our data shows that it still releases better. Uh, but look at all the different cutting methods. The fiber optic, the fiber optic with electropolish, and the pulsed, they're all the same. So what's that mean? Um, basically, you know, it's, they're all equivalent once you sort of adjust for the actual volume that you have in that aperture. So we believe that the increased transfer efficiency for these fiber optic lasers is real. Um, just not so sure that it's because of the smoother walls. Um, our data would seem to suggest that it has a little bit more to do with the actual real volume of that aperture and you're just able to print more.